today I have a special guest. Um, we're taking a little more of a serious note, uh, just talking about the coronavirus and everything that's going on. Uh, everybody, that seems to be the topic. Um, and it's a little strange because we keep getting different stories from everywhere, and obviously the cases and the extreme uh, cases are, you know, a little different every place and every state you go. Um, but I have a special guest here with me today. I'm going to let him introduce himself and where he's coming from, and he's going to help us kind of get into the thick of things with the coronavirus. So I am very honored to be here. My name is Atif Faruqi. I am an ER critical care doctor based in New York. Um, I know Callie because she's one of my mentors on the track, and uh, so that's pretty much it. I've been just trying to stay on top of all the data that's coming out, um, and we're literally in a situation where every hour the information is changing and our policies in the hospital are changing every hour. So I will do what I can to impart whatever knowledge I have. I'm not an expert, but I would say I'm just a skilled beginner, but um, yeah, I'll do what I can to give what I know. You're so modest. I love that you're like, <laughs> I don't have that much information. I, you know, I just work in the ER, no big deal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so we, we've had some good conversations before we got recording this morning. Um, I'm excited to talk with you. Um, I just had a ton of people asking me um, just basic stuff you know, because you have so many of your social media platforms, obviously, that is pulling people every direction of, oh, it's not that serious. Oh, it is super serious. You know, you're going to die. So it's kind of all over the place, especially for people that have never been through anything like this. So obviously, you know, a lot of people, when they were told to stay home, essential businesses closed, that, of course, it would freaked out a lot. And so maybe just getting started, what is the virus exactly? And why is it, you know, spreading so rapidly? So the virus is, um, everyone commonly calls it COVID-19. Um, the actual virus is the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and SARS is a term that's familiar to a lot of people. Um, it is a family of coronaviruses. You, I mean, people have probably seen that image of the little ball with the red things all around it that's commonly used. That's the general structure that we see under an electron microscope of the coronavirus. All those red things are the corona or the crown of the virus. Um, and coronavirus is a subset of viruses that include the common cold. It includes what was SARS. It includes what was MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and now the SARS-CoV-2A. SARS-CoV-2-1 was SARS. Um, COVID is the disease. But for simplicity, people tend to call the virus COVID as well. Um, and it's pretty much just the reason why initially people were downplaying it was because it was similar to the flu in the way it was spreading and the way it could potentially be controlled. Um, but also because we kind of were blindsided by it with how quickly things happened. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it is, it's tricky because the, it's as scary as people are saying it is. It is as dangerous. Um, people are dying from it at a, an alarming rate. Um, but it's because information is coming out so frequently, it's very easy for people to slip in a lot of um, misinformation and nonsensical things, especially in regards to the remedies and also being fueled by using fear as a tool. It's very easy to use this to get people scared and panicky, which is panic is the problem. Fear is not so much the problem, right? Because even bravery, people are fear, fearful, but panic is the problem. Panic is what we all got to worry about. That's what I keep telling my husband, Kyle. Um, I'm not so worried about the coronavirus. I'm worried about the people, once you stick them in their homes for, you know, a month <laughs> yeah. and what they're going to start doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, based on the information we have, because the, the problem is the testing is also something that's novel as well. Um, so all of the data we have is actually not accurate in terms of how many people actually have the disease um, because of people being asymptomatic and whatnot, which we can get into in a little bit. But from the data we have to the most reliable extent, the 
mortality or the death rate is approaching 3%. Um, whereas two weeks ago, it was about one and a half to 2%. So that rate is increasing. However, it's tricky to know, number one, the numbers are daily increasing by thousands in terms of positive cases, but we don't know, are those new cases or are those just cases that were there that are now testing positive? And then there's the whole pop part of the population that is asymptomatic and never would have gotten tested. Like I could have it right now, I don't know. Um, which gets into the uh, quarantine part, which we can get into at your, at your queue. No pun intended. Ha <laughs> ha, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> when you kind of touch, so like you just said, some people don't even know that they have it. So do we know why some are being spared and then why others are being hit so badly? I've heard obviously that it's, you know, the older generation, um, that it's people with previous respiratory issues. Is all of that true or is there more reasons or not so many reasons? So that is a mixture of things. So undoubtedly the fragile population, the elderly, the people with uh, weaker immune systems, um, and the very, very, very young infants, neonates, uh, you know, newborns, um, they are definitely at higher risk, but they're at higher risk for anything. Um, the more medical problems you have, the higher risk you are for this, just as you are for the flu. The thing is, though, is it's gotten to a point where it's completely unpredictable because, um, over the last few days, two or three uh, medicine uh, or medical residents uh, who are in training have passed away in their 20s and 30s. Um, so we don't know. We don't know how it's exactly working. Um, and we, to be honest, from my perspective, when I see patients, I don't risk stratify them based on what they have in terms of their history. I really have to just go by how they're presenting to me and what their vital signs look like because anybody is a target pretty, pretty much gotcha so this everybody i feel like the millennial generation um you see a lot of backlash you know them all being like oh kind of like we were talking about earlier you can't keep me in this is america you know i'm not going to be infected yada 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 but it's kind of like hey kids <laughs> well <laughs> nobody yeah, well, is above this thing <clears throat> you know the the relieving thing since you and i are technically millennials the nice thing is the millennial generation is now at a point where it's the millennials who are the doctors. It's the millennials who are in the generation working class. My apologies. I can't. Or lower. Maybe yeah. it's Generation Z. I don't know. Maybe but, Gen X and Gen Z. That's right. My That was my mistake. Um, but I no, mean, I, it's... The younger it's kids. Me. I always felt like I was an older soul. So <laughs> I always... <laughs> I'm like, I'm not a millennial, but yeah, you're right. I am a millennial. Dang it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, an honorary, I'm an honorary Xer as well. So <laughs> we're just going to um, make our own generation. That's, yeah. We're going we're gonna to call it the workers. <laughs> 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 um, all right. So uh, next up, I, everybody's talking about the mask. And obviously, um, since we kind of touched, you know, it can affect anyone. You know, nobody's out. Of, you know, no one's in the clear. What are some preventative things that we can do? Obviously, self-isolating, social distancing are key. But if we have to go to the grocery store or, you know, for some people, they are still working. So is there anything um, that helps? Like I see a ton of people with the masks, but I've heard that some masks work, some masks don't, that they have to be a certain rating or you're just wasting your money. So can you give us a little ghost busters or myth buster on the mask as well yeah. and other so, things that could help too? Well, so the, the good and bad part about that is the answer to prevention is sort of boring. And at this point, cliche, um, really the ultimate answer is to isolate yourself, um, which I will try to explain in a little bit more of a tangible way so people can understand but staying at home, they're not actually idle. They're actually actively fixing the problem. With regards to masks, that's also a difficult thing for me to recommend to people because I'm on the end where, you know, I come home and I'm putting my mask in my oven to bake for half an hour so I can sterilize it and use it tomorrow um, because I don't have enough. Um, whereas in Brooklyn, some guy just got arrested from the FBI for hoarding 80,000 masks in his house and selling them for profit. 
Um, there's also the fact that, uh, I don't know if this is the same in California, but in New York, we just got, we have a plastic bag ban that started on March 1st. So places aren't using plastic bags. However, I was walking home the other day and the apartment building next to mine had a pile of gloves on the floor. So what are we really doing? Um, and that's where the panic comes in. People don't think long-term about that stuff. Um, but also aside from that rant, the only time, like the reason we as medical professionals need masks is because we are literally in people's faces. So to give you an example, when we're putting people on a ventilator, when we go down the path of what we call intubation, when we put a breathing tube down someone's throat, their face is less than three feet away from mine and their mouth is wide open so I can get the tube in, which means any air that's coming out of their airway, which is where the virus lives, is coming straight up at me. So one of the things we're using is we're using plastic sheets to throw over them and using our techniques through that sheet so that we can do what we can to stop it. That being said, we also don't have all the information as to how the virus is spreading, whether it's spreading through uh, what we call aerosolization or if it's just droplet. We definitely know droplet is an issue. Um, basically physical droplets come out and land on things and that's called a fomite and from what we're finding is those fomites can live on a surface for up to four or five days um so that's what the surgical masks are for the plain old surgical masks not the n95 that they call um and the I mean, the reason why they're called N95s is because they're theoretically meant to filter out 95% of particles under a certain size if they're worn correctly, which wearing it correctly requires fit testing. Um, and they don't work for facial hair, which is why I'm shaven at the current time. Um, beards don't help. They, they, it prevents the mask from working correctly. But when you need a mask is when you're up in the face of somebody who is coughing or you're treating somebody who has the virus. Uh, the best thing you can do is isolate yourself, wash your hands. If you're going to the store and you don't have a mask, don't touch your face. And these are things that parents teach their kids, or at least when I was a kid, parents used to teach their kids, stop touching everything, stop touching your face and all this stuff. That's what you, people, that. need, you know, people need to just stop doing that. And that's going to make a significant difference, that and washing hands. Um, and how people can help stop the spread um, again, getting into a little bit of technical stuff, but I think your audience can grasp it. Um, there's something in biostatistics called an R theta value, and that value is basically, it quantifies the rate of spread of a disease. Um, and the, vi the, the values are usually less than one, equal to one, or greater than one. Less than one means the disease is on its way down. Equal to one means the disease is at a steady state, and greater than one is, meant, is that the disease is growing or spreading. Um, so whoever's listening at home, I want you to take out a piece of paper and you can try this. This is how the coronavirus spreads. Um, the, so the R theta value of the coronavirus is 2.5 to 2.9. What that means is if you take a piece of paper, draw a little dot, and on that dot, draw three lines coming out of it. At the end of those three lines, draw a dot. And off of each of those dots, draw three more lines. And keep doing that three lines, put a dot at the end of each line, three more lines off of each dot. That's how it's spreading. The R theta value of 2.5 to 2.9 means one person. Just that little bit. I mean. <laughs> yep, exactly. So one person is giving it to three people on average. So now if you imagine if you take that same diagram and erase one dot, how significant does that tree now reduce, right? And to give you another example, let's say the entire United States today completely locked down, did not go anywhere except when absolutely necessary. And let's say 50% of the population was positive for the disease and 50% was negative. If you lock down, that 50% will not get it, theoretically, right? In an ideal situation. That other 50%, those are all positive cases, right? If we look back at what I was saying about the let's say 3% of the population that's passing away. That's 3% of the 50% that have it, right? Of that 50% is going to be people who are asymptomatic, who have no symptoms whatsoever, who are going to fight the disease internally and it'll just go away. Now you've removed another significant portion of the population who are isolated. They're not giving it to anybody else. 
and they're also not going to the hospitals. Now, if you take the population of people who do have symptoms, of those is a significant number of people who have fever, body aches, cough, you know, uh, runny nose, diarrhea, some belly discomfort, whatever, the flu. And it's going to last three weeks is the average of what people are dealing with. Three to four weeks, they're dealing with this disease. Those people will recover on their own if they stay home, drink lots of water, take warm showers to help release some secretions and all this stuff. Again, now reduce the significant number going to the hospital. Now the hospital is reserved for the people who truly have trouble breathing. We can make the determination, you can go home, you need to stay. And then of those people, now we can start dealing with the truly sick people who need to be in our care. So now you've not only decreased the burden among the population, but you've decreased the burden among the hospitals. Um, so that's why isolation is so important. And you know, I, I don't know if you had had this recorded or not, but we were talking about the example of you give a kid a marshmallow and you tell them you can have this one now, or you can have two if you wait later. And while people are freaked out about the uncertainty of when are we gonna be able to go back to work, if you live on the uncertainty and you panic and start leaving, that curve that we're trying to flatten not only goes up again because the asymptomatic carriers are transmitting it and the people who are kind of sick are giving it to other people, that curve will not only go high again, but it'll go higher for longer, which means your fear of staying home for two months with uncertain income and uncertain of what's going to happen is now going to become a year, two years, three years. We don't know. Um, so that's pretty much why isolation is so important. So a significant amount of protection comes from the isolation, staying six feet from somebody, because that's what we understand the droplet transmission to be, and washing your hands a ton and don't touch your face. If you are in the situation where you're caring for a loved one who might have it and you need to protect yourself and you need to get close to them and help them and touch and all this stuff, then you can wear a surgical mask and you can wear gloves if you can, you know, if you can have, grab a hold of them. The N95 masks are something that we're still studying and trying to figure out if that indeed is necessary. What we have found is that the cases that an N95 becomes necessary, and I'm going to use technical terms for a particular reason, are patients who are requiring CPR, intubation, or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. If none of those three things are words that ever have come across in your life, you don't need an N95 mask. What those situations are, are when we put people on ventilators with a mask or a tube down their throat that's forcing air into their lungs, what we call positive pressure ventilation, that has the potential to turn the fomite into a spray, like a perfume. That's aerosolization, right? Like a can of spray paint. That can be inhaled and that can travel further and be for longer. That's the way tuberculosis spreads, for example. Um, but for us in the hospital, those are the situations where we buckle down and use the N95 masks. However, because things are changing so frequently and because we are in such a significantly dangerous situation, um, what we've been doing is going against manufacturer recommendations for the mask. And in New York, what they're doing is trying to use one mask per week. Uh, and where I'm working, we are using one mask the whole day and leaving it on all day and then we use a surgical mask on top to try and protect that mask. Um, we're just basically trying to ration. Um, and I, like I mentioned earlier, baking masks, there's some information out there, and this is not relevant to the public, but uh, it's relevant to even idea of what we're having to, to deal with. Um, there's some evidence to say that if you bake the mask for 160 degrees for half an hour, it sterilizes it without uh, compromising its integrity. So some of us are trying that. Um, but the fact of the matter is we don't have um, everything we need yet. And I think hopefully a lot of companies are going to start manufacturing and figuring out what we need. And hopefully that'll, that'll get fixed. But what we in the hospitals are doing, and I know it's a long answer, but what we in the hospitals are doing are the same thing we're recommending to everybody else. Um, constant hand sanitizers, not even like normally we do it between patients. That was pre-COVID. Now I'll be sitting at the computer and every half an hour I'll get up and use a hand sanitizer wash my hands three or four times a shift um, up to my elbows, just like, you know, we do in the operating room. Um, and really being conscious not to touch your face. Um, and then the other thing with masks is, and gloves is it can actually increase the spread for the general population because we have 
specific classes and in-servicing sessions on how to don and doff all of our equipment. You can't grab a mask you used off your face to take it off. You can't scratch. Oh, I didn't even use. think about that, yeah. So the way we take off our masks is in a particular way. We don't touch the mask. We have to reach from behind. When we ungown ourselves, we have to take the gown off from up in front. We can't do it rapidly because that could spread stuff. You have to fold it up in front of us a certain distance away. We have to have a spotter to make sure behind us we're not touching. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so just having a mask doesn't help. In fact, a mask can probably hurt more, especially because the mask is itchy and people are scratching their faces and you know doing all these things. So well, that's just wash like, your hands, stay isolated. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of everybody with the classic gloves. It makes me nervous because I feel like people now have this like, oh, I can touch whatever I want now. And they forget to wash their hands. And now, and, and a lot of them, like I've seen people in the grocery stores that have got like the hardcore masks and the gloves and, you know, like long sleeves, long pants. But then you see them like touching everything and like all this. And I'm like, you're wasting your time. <laughs> and you can and everybody actually... looks at me crazy because I haven't worn a mask or or gloves anywhere. I, I go to the grocery store and like everybody looks at me like I'm nuts. But the only mm -hmm. people around here in California that are wearing the mask, um, I feel like anybody I've seen has been probably age 50 and over. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this area, I don't think there's been any cases, uh, to my knowledge, of anyone, you know, younger crowd. So everyone here is still in their mind. I think they think, unless you know, you're older, have like a respiratory problem, you can't get it. And that's, I've had several friends that I've talked to that are like, oh, I'm fine. And I'm like, oh, are you that stupid? Like, no, like, <laughs> it's not just like, oh, you're X amount of, you know, years old, you're in the clear, just go on and party. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like, well, you know, speaking of partying, one of the things I and others have been thinking about is, you know, Sure, you, you might be 25, 30 years old and you don't have any medical problems. And even if you go to the doctor regularly and you get checked, but number one, you live in a major metropolitan area, so there's pollution. You don't know what that's doing to your lungs. Your lungs are not normal. Uh, you go out partying because you're young and healthy. And at the very least, you're inhaling secondhand smoke from hookah and vaping and smoking and marijuana and all these other things. Um, some people are out there doing drugs and it doesn't affect them immediately, but you don't know what your health state is. And even though you've survived other things like the flu, which has killed a lot of people, this is a completely different um, completely enemy. Different. And they yeah. say the enemy you know is better than the enemy you don't. Um, imagine an enemy that had an infinite amount of knowledge about the battlefield and could change the battlefield to the way it wants on a whim. By the time we we're starting to ramp up for this virus two weeks after it really got popular. The virus had mutated to such an extent that we didn't actually have one virus. And viruses do that. Viruses are uh, notorious for mutating. Um, it's, it's both beautiful and scary at the same time. Viruses have always been something that fascinated me in medical school. Um, and one of the things I find really interesting is the way you see a virus. This is you know, probably something you might edit out because it's not helpful for people, but I just find it amazing. You know, you have a, a microscope, you've used microscopes in school to see little bacteria on your skin or whatever, right? And it magnifies things so much. So that's a light microscope that uses light. It shoots light at something, the light bounces back and you see it. A virus is seen under an electron microscope. So instead of using light to shoot at something, it shoots electron particles at something and it creates an imprint on the film that creates an image. That's how you see a virus. But to see the virus under an electron microscope, once you shoot the electrons, you then have to magnify the image by 100,000 times to see it under the microscope. Now, if you did that to a grain of rice, the grain of rice would be the size of a football field. Holy crap. That's how small this thing is. That's it's crazy. Completely, you know, and it is very intelligent, despite not having a, a, people debate whether it's even alive or not. People debate whether a virus is alive or, or you know, um, inanimate, just so to speak, um, but it's very intelligent in the way it mutates, and it has DNA, and R this one has RNA, which is a single strand form of DNA, basically, that incorporates into your DNA, replicates with your replication process, and then spreads. Um, so it's, it's 
it's it's crazy it's a one one thing it's an army it's it's insane um and that's why what you need to do is not allow it to get to another person not allow it to get somewhere else that's why again as boring as it is you gotta isolate you gotta stay away as much as you can until it's safe to come out um because yesterday i think was the first time that the upward curve started to get less upward but so today I think it might be going up. Yeah. So it, it may or may not be turning into a bell. We don't know yet. Um, and it changes literally every day. I have a website that I look at and I'm refreshing pretty much every hour and the numbers are changing. Um, so it's, that's really the extent of it. And the answers are boring, but the most oh, important thing. These answers are boring at all. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the most important thing to do is isolate, wash your hands, don't touch your face um stay six feet away from people um it feels rude sometimes to like kind of like step away or like i'm walking <laughs> on the street and somebody walking their dog will go to the side but it's the situation it's you know it's something we have to understand and if you absolutely don't need protective equipment don't use it because there are people out there who need really it. need it well and as far as this is a message to all you toilet paper and paper towel hoarders <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where y'all are from, but we learned where I grew up that you can wipe your butt with a rag if you need to <laughs> and just wash that. <laughs> stop being wasteful and stop hoarding all the toilet paper and paper towels. Oh, I see. You can have the toilet paper. Just give us the masks. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, somebody was saying because of the shortage with that, a lot, a lot of the same companies do it all. So they've been put so far behind with the toilet paper and paper towel shortage that they they don't have as many hands on or as many materials to then also do masks is that no, true think, or is that one of those exaggerations it's hard to say what is true and is not but i think people really like to get caught up in complicated answers and i like to simplify things the simple answer is let's say there was a single company that was making these things it was unanticipated this is at least for a long time since 1918, this is an unprecedented situation, which makes this a really amazing time to live in that we get to live through a pandemic because on a positive note, and there is a positive note, there is a lot to be done. I mean, no doctor likes to be called a hero. I can speak for every single physician, but it is an amazing period of time to be, to be seen in a way where we're actually helping. And one of the things that causes a lot of burnout in medicine is um, moral injury, as we call it. Um, and it's an amazing time to, to be working and to be alive. Uh, and I say that to the audience because as a general non-medical public, if you do your part, you are just as much a hero as anybody else. Um, it's a group effort. Um, so this is definitely a time where everyone needs to, on a worldwide scale, needs to unify and kind of fall in line. Well, that's the one thing positive because um you know me i try to be little miss sunshine with as much as i can so i've been joking with everybody of you know hey vacation time like anybody that's wanting to you know like get away and go to like meditation or whatever i know your home usually isn't the best place but you know take this time to self-reflect and you know relax and try not to freak out and panic and you know just stay healthy and away from everyone and I think everything's, you know, gonna go back to normal if we can all resist the temptation of uh, continuously leaving our homes and, you know, not doing what we're supposed to do, which it sucks. And I feel like I'm a little kid getting grounded again, you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm back at my parents' house in high school. Uh, you know, I'm grounded for the weekend. I don't get to go to the party, but I think, you know, in the long run, it's, it's better for everybody. Well, you know, in in the realm of positivity um one positive i mean there's a lot of things that i have to say about that but um one obvious positive thing that people take for granted is yeah you're stuck at home and you might feel grounded but on a positive note you get to be safe because one of the reasons why new york and new jersey are being hit so hard um is because shelters are very close quarters and homeless populations cannot escape it um, and in fact, they will only survive if we stay home because we're going to give it to them. 
um, nursing home populations are at risk. Um, so for you to have the ability to go somewhere and isolate yourself is a big blessing. Um, and the, the simple answer is if the only one of two things will happen, either we'll isolate and we'll be able to tackle the issue or natural selection will occur at its finest in which everybody will get it and the ones who live, live and the ones who don't, don't. Either you will fight the virus, the virus will fight you. There's only really two options. Either everybody has to get it or we hold it back so nobody else gets it. Um, and this is one of those situations where partial quarantine is gonna be a problem because not only will partial quarantine cause everyone to get it, but because people are half-assing it, it'll take longer for it to go away. Um, but the other thing I will say about what you're saying about stay home, meditate and reflect and whatnot, uh, one of the things I find, so the last three months, as you know, I was off from work because I was between jobs and um, it was a turning point to the, I don't, I, I can't recognize who I am anymore in a good way um, because the, the wiring I'm doing in my brain of, of moving towards positivity to a point where I am fatiguing the negative part is occurring. And I'm starting to see more, uh, more positivity and things, more opportunity rather than obstacles, um, uh, getting into my entrepreneurial side, um, things I never thought I would do. And one of the things that I had heard and thought about was human beings are, built to adapt, if nothing else. Um, and if you think about it, let's, you take an animal like a horse or a goat or whatever, and when they're born, the first thing they do, aside from feed, is they get up and walk. Humans don't do that, right? We don't walk right away. It takes years for us to learn, and it's hard, and we fall, and we trip, and we look stupid doing it. Or kids look cute, but if, you know, <laughs> Um, no, but we learn to walk. <laughs> we learn to walk, and it's hard, but we get there, and now we do it like it's nothing. We were born in a state of adapting. So why can't that apply to anything else? If there is a skill you never thought you could do, well, one thing that I've learned is a passion or a talent is not, you're not born with it. It's cultivated, and it starts with an interest in something, and an interest is external. You have to expose yourself to things, to, uh, to new ideas, to new skills that might spark a fire in you. And I'm not sponsored by any companies, but I've been using Skillshare. Skillshare, you can learn anything online or LinkedIn learning or whatever it is. Um, this is an opportunity for you to tackle the things that you always said you don't have time to do. Um, and you never know what you'll be exposed to. And maybe you'll learn, it'll lead you to something else. And being concerned about my financial status is unstable. What if you learn a new skill and you become something else you never thought you would? So there's adaptability is huge and there's always something you can do with your free time and hopefully eventually everybody will get back on their feet. And to those who may have lost a job, you can gain another skill. To those who are always in some difficulty, you can gain a new skill and you're never too old. So long as you check your wrist and have a pulse, you're able to adapt and learn. Well, that's the fun thing about being a human. Everybody makes fun of me. I was that little nerdy kid when I was little that was like, why, why, how does this work? Why, show me, you know, I, I was that child in my poor mother and father. Okay, Callie, like, just go over here. It just, it just does that. <laughs> no, my parents were, were really good about explaining things. My poor mother, bless her soul. Um, but no, I agree with you. And the, and the really neat thing too is because of, the trying time. A lot of these companies are making these classes or these presentations or like things you can learn free right now too. Because I've seen a ton of universities that are releasing free courses. I've seen tons of, you know, digital marketing courses. Um, I know like obviously everybody's trying to market and sell online. But I mean, there's so many programs now, like the Amazon Associates program and influencer that are trying to help people, you know, get some momentum and gain some money. And yeah, I, I think it's a time to be creative and maybe think outside of your box because um, I do think regardless that this is going to have, it already has had a huge impact on our world. And I do think a lot of things are going to change after this is done. Um, mm -hmm. 
I do think we were already kind of moving in the direction of virtual reality and augmented reality. I think that this is going to like be a huge jump. Um, I've had the benefit of working with some people in the music industry. And that's obviously you're seeing all the live streaming concerts popping up um, and get ready because you're going to start having it where like the augmented where you just put your phone in like the little head thing. You know what I mean? And it's going to feel like you're you're there in the space and you'll mm -hmm. be able to see other people in that space too. You'd be like an avatar. Yeah, there's like crazy stuff coming. So I tell everybody, um, you know, I, I start researching that kind of stuff, especially even if you are in a business. Like I had a, mm -hmm. a friend of ours that carts with us. Um, he owns a, like the painting by numbers thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like randomly was like, hey man, <laughs> he probably thinks I'm crazy because I don't talk to him all that often. But I was like, hey man, uh, I just had a meeting with some music people of mine. They're getting ready. I was helping plan like a concert thing. And uh, I messaged him and was like, hey, you could totally do your painting thing still. I said, offer it to people at home. I was like, and if they're in a close enough distance, just send them, you know, mail them like the little paint pack, have that included in the price, and then do like a Google Hangout or a Zoom or something and have your teacher and everybody can just join in. And then everybody can see everyone else's paintings. It almost makes it, you know, a, some of the stress taken off and like that. So he actually uh, did a successful one just a few days ago. So he was like, that worked. Thank you so much. <laughs> exactly. Like, everybody's just got to think about, you know, different ways to, to market and different ways to do their business. Um, and, and the same thing, like maybe that person thought about what you said and was like, oh, that wouldn't work. But then you said to do it and they did it. You don't know until you try it. You exactly. don't realize what can happen. And when people out there hear motivational speakers who say, oh, you can get rich if you just try it. And then you kind of like, come on, be realistic. People hide negativity under the banner of being realistic. And the thing that I was told to ask was when someone says something that like that to you, that seems so far fetched, you should ask yourself, don't you hope that they're right? And yeah, you do hope they're right. And the only way you're going to find that is you could try And as you try, just be like, I hope that person was right. But you might try and fail at the particular direct target you were going at, but it might open up a door. It will open up a door that you didn't realize was there and who knows what will happen. No. And I feel like we'll have to have another episode on this because I feel like we could go down this rabbit hole, but I agree. I feel like too many people hide behind the excuse of, Oh, that just won't work or that's unrealistic or nobody will go for that. And um, I won't say any names, but I deal with that on a daily basis. <laughs> um, because I'm one of those people, I don't care. You can tell me no a hundred times. I know it's going to take a hundred no's or 300 no's or 400 no's for that reason until I even get a maybe sometimes. Yes. Um, but I guess that was my, uh, my parents, again, me always being like, why, why, why? <laughs> Them allowing me to do that is probably why I'm still like, well, why don't you want to do that? And that's my biggest thing too, is when people tell me no, I just don't allow them to tell me no. <laughs> I'm like, well, I want to grow. I want to get better. So hold on. I'm going to need a pen and paper. Will you tell me why you said no and like what I can do better or what could have made you say yes? And yeah. I think a lot of people, their egos get in the way. And it's, you know, it's all how the media and how the world shaped us to be, you know, this it's way. It's so, it's so it's, funny it's you so say that. It's so messed up. <laughs> it, but it's funny because what you just said is something that I've been doing for myself because I've always tried to pride myself on being smart or right. Whether or not I'm smart or right, I'm like, well, I have to get to that point. And I've realized how detrimental that is because your, your ego is based on being right and smart. And then when you, when you hit a point where someone says, you idiot, that's wrong. Your ego is now bruised. But what you just said about asking why, I started implementing that into when I am wrong. So I have started to try and pride myself not on being smart, but on being a learner. And so when someone says, you're an idiot, you screwed that up, the next question should be, how did I do that? How did I screw that up? Because it becomes something anti-fragile. Because if, you're, if your ego is based on being the learner, you can never fail. Because if someone says you screwed up, your pride is based on learning. So now you will learn how you screwed up. 
and it's just going to change your ego. So I've been implementing the exact thing you just said. It, it's hard because we're taught so much, you know, and again, I love my parents. I love my family. But, you know, growing up as a kid, like when we were wrong or we did something wrong, we got in a lot of trouble or, you know, growing up on a farm, you know, and it wasn't that my parents weren't doing the right thing. You know, we messed up on the farm. That could be, you know, an animal not getting fed. That could be what we sell for how we make it through the winter or the food on the table, you know? Yeah. So it's a little different now versus, you know, if I mess something up now, I can just go to the grocery store. It's crazy how times have changed. Yeah. Um, so, but I, it was implemented into my head when I was younger, you know, oh, I can't mess up. I can't mess up. If I mess up, I'm, you know, excuse my language, I'm a fucking failure. And, you know, and it would almost give me anxiety sometimes. And mm -hmm. when I would mess up something or not do something right. And I still battle with this today. Like I get so upset with myself, whether anybody else is upset at me, like everybody else can think I did awesome. And in my head, if I know I messed up just somewhere along the way, whether people see it or not, to me, it's not good enough. And that's like something I've been like trying to get better at of, you know, you can't be perfect. There's yeah. no such thing as perfect in social media and TV and everything that we're pumped full of 24, seven hours a day, seven days yeah. a week you know, we're made to believe that there are perfect people out there and that people do things perfect all the time and look perfect all the time. And it's like, no, there's absolutely no perfect person, no perfect looking perfect, no perfect nothing. <laughs> and yeah. We, we got to keep telling ourselves that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it's hard to remember sometimes. Um, but we've kind of gotten off topic. <laughs> That's why I was like, oh my God, this is a really good a whole nother episode I feel like we could yeah. get and I wanted to tell you too um, I'm going to be doing like a racing episode fingers crossed I may have an indie car driver that'll be coming on with us so maybe you can join us in for that one too and fawn and drool <laughs> well that's if he can do it so I won't say any names but um I if I, if I give this away you'll probably know who it is but he's from my state from my home I have state. no idea about indie car I know okay perfect perfect yeah so he's from my home state. Um, I knew him way, way back when he was much younger, like in high school. Um, we had like mutual friends and stuff. So the radio station I used to work for in Nashville, the sports station, I've uh, been talking to some of those guys because I just thought it would be really interesting, obviously, during these times, um, trying to get an NBA player. I have a couple that may bite. So trying to get an NBA player and then um, may have an indie car driver. Just to like talk about obviously you know sports are shut down like worldwide and you kind of mentioned earlier this kind of uniting us I mean for once you know we're all dealing with the same thing in the world and I think this is a great time to connect and you know we're all one we're on an equal playing field and I joke and laugh because in a lot of movies you see this but like when something hits you know the world as a pandemic or you know the world's coming to an end or something you see everybody in these movies from all nationalities all forms of life kind of come together mm -hmm. and that is kind of one beautiful thing to this is you are seeing a lot of people from other countries and other backgrounds and other religions you know coming together on this or you know comforting one another and you see all the comments and positivity you know online and stuff which is really neat to see too um, so there, there is some good coming of it. And I joke with everybody that like, oh, you yeah. gotta, gotta look for that light in, in the tornado sometimes. <laughs> there is so much. The only negative thing about this is the fatalities. There, everything else is really positive about it. If you just look. Well, I, I hate everybody's been freaking out about having to stay home. I looked at as, did you see the pop, like the pollution? So there's like the graph that shows all the pollution, like, the ozone layers started to heal like and that's just with us slowing down for yeah. what has it been just been a month now because i mean that everybody slowed down and just within a month you see you know i joke we're diseased to the earth 24 7 like look what a you know a horrible impact we have on mother earth yeah and like what we're just guests. Yeah, what just a few changes, you know, make to that. And you kind of talked earlier that, you know, we're breathing in a lot of pollution and things too. And uh, yeah, it, it's crazy to think about how much of an effect this has had on everything. 
for sure. Um, and as we're wrapping up, though, I did want to touch before we started recording. Um, you had mentioned, obviously, that you know the rate of how many people have been infected has risen, and obviously that number has been risen, but that it kind of topped off a little bit. You said the last few days it hasn't been ri rising as dramatically, correct? Well, only yesterday the curve only was slightly yesterday. lower. So okay. we don't know. We're hoping that's a trend, but we don't know. And is that nationwide or is that just New Jersey, New York, or? It's nationwide. Nationwide. Um, but as we start testing more and as the wave starts moving west, uh, westward, we don't know what's going to happen. I hope that that wasn't just an anomaly, um, but we honestly don't know. It's hard to take hope from it. It's just a piece of information. And you kind of, you're or not kind of, you're in the thick of it being in New York, New Jersey. Um, and can you tell the audience a little bit, because we were talking about Central Park and what they're doing there and just mm -hmm. preventative things, you know, for in case the masses, because are all the hospitals full right now? Yes. Yeah. Pretty much, and yeah. And do you guys have any uh, temporary hospitals built or put up in your areas that you're using right now, or are you guys haven't had to go that far. So there are temporary hospital tents being built in Central Park. Um, there was a cruise ship that docked on the west side of Manhattan in order to uh, hospitalize non-COVID patients. Um, there are morgues being built in um, truck trailers, um, in army vehicles. Um, there are morgues being built in parking lots. Parks are being considered as temporary burial sites. We don't know yet, um, but hospitals have always, beds have always been an issue prior to COVID. Um, now it's getting to a point where um, ICUs are only reserved for certain people and really, really sick people who would need ICU care. Otherwise are being put in the regular medical floors and we're doing the best that we can. Um, the ERs are, boarding or holding a lot of patients that need to be admitted um yeah and we're we're starting to have to make critical decisions on who gets a ventilator and who has to unfortunately be left to pass naturally um as they were doing in italy uh so that's yeah we're we're definitely we've maxed out our resources now we're just trying to learn how to ration rationing is pretty much the name of the game now okay and you had mentioned too earlier um, that the morgues or like using the parks as temporary barrel grounds, are that many people dying that they can't keep up with, you know, the burial, like regular burial, or is it because of the disease, it can still spread once someone passes or? Both, um, the disease can still spread once someone passes. Um which is why uh, burial processes and funeral services are very, very different right now, which is why families can't visit. Um, the bodies can absolutely spread disease for sure. I mean, if the disease can live on a kitchen counter for four days, then it absolutely can spread from a body. Um, that's why autopsies are not being really done. Um, but we are also, so I always say that in emergency medicine, we're in a business of a bias toward illness. So we see, we see the deaths, right? The deaths are coming to us. So our view of it is all of the sick people. So a per large percentage of the patients that we have are dying. That doesn't represent the whole, whole population, um, but it's the rate at which they're passing. And it's almost getting to a point of predictability that not that we can predict who may or may not pass away, but we can predict once certain things have happened, this person's not gonna make it to, next, to the next day. Um, and that is all trying, we're trying to figure out the, you know, the spearheads of critical care and resuscitation are really trying to figure out and fine tune what it is that's causing it, what we're doing to contribute to the problem, um, and what we can do to try and mitigate it. But it's really just, we are really learning on the fly because this has only been a few weeks and it's constantly changing. So we're doing what we can with the information that we have. Crazy. Um, well, I know you said you have another call because um, you are working and taking care of us. So thank you. And thank you for working too. Um, I know I jokingly said something about thanking the grocery store lady earlier, but I, and I know Kyle and anybody I talk to, everyone's very appreciative for 
all of those, especially in the medical field. So thank you, because it's definitely some crazy times and not many people would <laughs> take a chance and do that kind of thing. So thank you very, very much. And thank you in your little bit of free time. Uh, you know, you're supposed to be sleeping right now, but uh, thanks for being on and talking with me about this. I'm sure you're probably over talking about it because that's all anyone wants to talk about. Well, so next time we'll talk, you know, racing and cars and carts and have a little more fun. It's really funny perspective because when I see people like you and Kyle and everyone else who I look up to because of your skill set, and then you turn around and say, what are you looking at a racing driver? Like, oh, are you looking up to us and you're doing this? So it's, it's all a matter of perspective. So it's very flattering and humbling to be looked at that way from people that I consider to be mentors. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we look <laughs> up to you. We both think the greatest of you. And uh, hopefully when all of this is done and over, we will uh, get out on the big track or something, BMW, go karting or something and have some fun. Let out some steam. <laughs> For sure. I told Actually, you I'm at least four tenths faster after this because I'm just like <laughs> yeah, ready to drive. <laughs> I'm going to lose all that weight. But um, <laughs> one of the things I was actually talking to some of my residents about um, was the fact that I, you know, come out with BMW and I get to drive with you guys. Um, what I was actually talking to them about possibly doing a corporate event to have the residents go out there for a day and maybe drive. And I know, you know, like, you get different types of people coming in there, um, but you've got a, a cool bunch of people who are down to earth, and I think it would be a lot of fun if they came out and did that. That would be that would awesome be so kind of cool. Show. Yeah. How many of you are there? There are maybe about 20, 25 of them, but I don't know if all of them will make it. I don't know if all of them have licenses or whatever, or if I can even get the institution to allow us to do it, but I'm going to check it out and see if what we can do. That would be so cool. And that would be, be awesome. a good sized group too to like have some good rivalry and yeah. Yeah. Hopefully amazing. I'll be an instructor by then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got this. I mean, in your free time, let us know. We'll start doing some coaching videos. I can teach a skid pad like it's nobody's business. <laughs> right? Oh my God. I wish I could go out on the skid pad today. That would be, I know I've been dreaming. Kyle's been playing like every racing game that he can possibly download. <laughs> We're both, yeah, we're both fiending to be back at the track, for sure. Yeah, I miss thermal, for sure. Oh, thermal, yeah. Thermal's such a gorgeous facility. It's hard not to miss that place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But all right, well, I will let you get back to work. Thank you so, sure. so much for taking time. And uh, I will slap Kyle and tell him he's got to get on a video conference with you. Sure. But I'll just keep it to myself till then. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I will say for anybody who needs any resources, um, I did send you um, two things. One is a podcast called This Won't Hurt a Bit. Um, it's a podcast that is designed by some of my mentors who I listen to their medical podcasts all the time. It's super entertaining. They're super goofy, um, but it's designed to teach medical stuff to the non-medical population. Um, they recently just did one on COVID. Um, so I would definitely listen to that and anything they say that counters what I've said, I would take what they said. Okay. Um, and the other thing as, uh, the best source for people to follow, I think is the world health organization that has information for the public when and how to use protective equipment if you need to in the public and, and what you can do to stay up to be up to date about what's going on. Awesome. And that was one of the websites, that website you sent me to, correct? That was a World gonna, Health Organization, yeah. Perfect. I'm going to post all of those um, when I post this as well. And if you want um, headshot or anything too, like on the website or any uh, information or anything on you as well, um, you can send it to me and I'll put it up there. Okay. Yay. But awesome. Probably we'll be, <laughs> you probably will. Fine, whatever. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, guys, that's queued up for today. Hope you got some great information um, on the coronavirus and everything going on. Uh, everybody, please stay safe. I know we're all getting a little crazy, but uh, stay in. Uh, or if you have to get out, make sure you're staying six feet away uh, and just taking the right precautions.